James, you've been in Formula One for over 20 years at this point, a pretty crazy, transformative time for this sport. Um, you spent the bulk of that time at Mercedes, at the very pinnacle of it, eight world championships in a row. And in 2023, you moved to Williams for a very different kind of challenge, a bit closer to the back of the grid. How do you make that shift and when you're thrown in the deep end? So it, it, I had the privilege and honor to really be part of an organization and a team that that did everything you can almost do in a sporting world. Um, they, we won everything that there was to win. And it became an organization where we were really just fine-tuning small details of it. And I'm, I'm built slightly differently. I'm someone that really enjoyed the journey when we were building down to foundations and changing almost the world through what we were doing. And when I get to the point where I just feel as though we're into the detail, that's the point for me of which I need to start finding a new challenge that pushes me on. And at the end of, end of 22, really, I felt it was a natural, organic way to either change significantly what I was doing within Mercedes or go and really establish myself elsewhere in a new challenge. And uh, it was very organic. There was a call with Williams that took place. There was for transparency a call with three other teams, actually. It was just coincidence that took place. But Williams and myself just gelled. It's an organization that, for, for all of these that, that hopefully may or may not know this, but but Williams today is the second most successful team on the grid. That isn't Mercedes, that isn't McLaren, it's, it's Williams. They have 114 wins to their name, nine championships, seven drivers' championships. And to have the opportunity to be at the helm of that, but not just to be the helm of that, to do that with investment. I, I put a number on the table and no one blinked. I'm like, okay. Um, to do that, you get once in a lifetime opportunity. So. Um, it, it wasn't actually a hard decision. It was an easy decision the day I did that. And when we spoke, you told me that you, when you first came into Formula One, a team was maybe 250, 300 people. At Mercedes, it was a staff of over 1,000. At Williams, you're not far off that. How can, you, how can you explain and how do you manage that kind of expansion? I mean, it, it is mad when you think about it, isn't it? It's two racing cars, and I've got 1,000, 1,100 roughly is where it will end up, people um, designing, building um, that car and operating that car. Um, so exactly that. When I first started, this is now around about the year 2000, I was employee number 255. And I did, I did everything. Uh, you, you sort of worked a little bit in vehicle dynamics, a little bit in aero, a little bit in race engineering, a little bit in software, a little bit in research and development. And I loved it because you got to learn so many different disciplines and you were empowered to do a large amount. What happened though is, as you would imagine, as the sport grew and it became more and more competitive, we also added individuals to the organization in order to, to get there. And if you look back, many of you hopefully Google it afterwards, a, a sort of 2000s car, you'll see it's just very straight edges. Now go and look, and hopefully you can have a look at, at, at our car across the weekend, and you'll see if there is a straight edge, typically I'll come across and get angry. Nothing should be straight on the car. Everything should be aerodynamically driven and complicated. And so it's gone from about 1,000 components to 20,000 components, all designed in-house, nearly all produced wow. in-house. And therefore, the workforce has increased as well. The second thing that's changed is back in the 2000s, it'd be very normal to design a car, produce it, and then maybe in the year, change it once? Maybe not. We're now updating the car realistically once every three, four weeks. That's what you're trying to do. So it's a prototype that you're never staying still. And to give you an idea of how significant that is, if I took this car here, this Williams here, it would have been winning races last year, no doubt about it. That's, that's the evolution fundamentally. And we're now in a situation where we're, we're scoring points. But the, the if we stop developing this car, we'll fall straight back towards the back of the grid. You have to, it's a development race, it's an arms race between everyone and, and workforce size to a certain extent, including efficiency and automation and software dictates that. Mm -hmm. And you're correct, we're about now, uh, as I say, about 1,100 and that's, that's ballpark the size of, of most teams. And that's changed the role of the team principal as well for, as manager, um, you know, overseeing the engineering side as well and now kind of reality TV star. <laughs> <laughs> Not there yet, but um, you really don't want to see my reality TV. It's mostly just trying to deal with a sort of 10 month old that wants to go her own way. Um, but uh, here's what it is. It, I it is changed. It used to be managing 250 people. And for all of those, I know many of you are C-suite out here, many of you are executive vice presidents, presidents, so you'll know this. M managing a actually an organization of about 250, you can do that with one or two people. 
mm -hmm. you can't. There's about a threshold. There's, there's various papers on it. It's, been up, it's about 250, actually, uh, is a threshold. And at that point there, you're done. You can't manage it. And that's what happened to Williams. It was run by two really great individuals mm -hmm. and sort of grew up to 400 people, and it sort of started collapsing as a result of that. So the secret behind it is that it's not about one person. I have a fantastic management committee behind me that are all brilliant in their own arenas. Um, we have uh, Fred, who is a CEO that came from Pat & Whitney. He ran organizations of 10,000 people. I have Anne, who came from BP, who was running HR teams that were dealing with oil rigs and others all over the world. Again, about 10,000 people, managing 1,000 now today. Um, and it's sort of a world of change. You have to surround yourself by excellence in order to run an organization that way. Mm -hmm. And, and what lessons were you able to bring over from Mercedes where you were one of those people who was being delegated to? Um, the, the main thing is this. Um, I, it's, it's a little bit for Mercedes and it's a lot for myself. First and foremost, the way I operate, the way I am as a human being is, is about openness and transparency. Everything that you hear now today is me as an individual. There's no difference or change irrespective of whether it's to an audience, on a camera, or to my my workforce. Um, I believe in leading by example. Th there's no point talking words if you're not ready to enact them yourself at the same time. And the workforce knows that I will wake up at ballpark 6 a.m. and from that point onwards, every minute is dedicated towards Williams. Every minute is dedicated towards us moving forward. And when I go to bed at night, the last emails flow out at about 10 p.m. That, that is what I do within my life. And I've decided that that's where I want to put everything into it. And the sacrifices, sacrifices on the family side and and other elements in the world, but I'm comfortable with it. And so I lead by example, fundamentally, I want my managers and I want my, uh, I call them lieutenants, it uses an army term, but I think it's a very apt way of describing it. I have five lieutenants, they then have five lieutenants they put in place, and that creates the accountability structure. Um, but they all lead by example. Whatever mm -hmm. you do is what your workforce will do in response. So act in the way that you want them to be. Mm -hmm. That was very much not create in Mercedes, but how I manage there and how our senior management manage together. The second one is failure. Our, our business, to give you an idea, I'm asking engineers to completely push the boundaries of engineering. Uh, it's not aerospace or other areas where you have a five-year development cycle. You've got two weeks, two weeks to get this right. There's no failure that's possible in as much as you have to deliver a product. But in doing that, you are going to fail so many times. And the really important bit to me is not hiding it, it's the opposite. Anyone that fails in our organization because they're pushing the boundaries, because they're innovating, I put on a pedestal. Um, it can be in an email that goes out three times a week uh, to the organization, it can be actually in person. But you demonstrate, here's what we were doing, here's why it's just completely changing the game for everyone else. Here's why it went wrong, and here's the learning that we're cycling back through it again. And the more that you can do that, the more you can demonstrate that the failure element of things is how you become much stronger not much weaker. Mm -hmm. And no one in my organization will be removed for failure. It's quite the opposite. If you're there hiding information, then that becomes a problem. Right. And, and in your workforce, no one is more public, no one is more visible than the two guys who pull on a helmet and squeeze themselves into the cockpits every other Sunday. Um, and as a team principal, you had to make one of the toughest calls there is for a team principal this year, switching one of your drivers mid-season. Um, how do you deal with that and how do you sort of execute that decision? Yeah, it, it really was, um, it, in my career, the, the toughest decision I made. Because it's no, it's no different, I'm afraid, to removing an individual from your organization. It's just this was done to 70 million people watching, or 1.5 billion across the season. So it just a little bit more vis visibility. You can't hide anywhere. Um, I'm very data-driven. So the decisions I've made, first and foremost, actually, I'll go back to my, my core, my ethos. I was a graduate 30 years ago, and I'm here running an organization of 1,000 people today. And I was done because people believed in me, invested in me, and gave me opportunity. So in my ethos, in my core, is I believe in investing in future generations, I, be that graduates or young drivers. But you don't just push someone there. They have to pass first gateways in order to make sure that they have the ability to get there, because you're putting an enormous amount of pressure on their shoulders. And so young drivers, both in Williams's history and in mine, will always appear and they'll always be there as a part of things. And we invest a lot. I don't mean just financially, it's a lot of financial investment. I mean time, effort, um, through psychological help and just building them up through their career as well. So the decision was based on this. First half of the year, we did not produce a car that was capable of points at every Grand Prix. That, that is on us and that is our responsibility. So in that circumstance, if I can invest in Logan, 
and give him the best opportunity to prove himself when the car's quick enough, mm -hmm. I will do, which is what we did. When it got to the point that very clearly we've now changed the car and we're in a situation where we can start fighting for significant championship points, but I don't have two drivers delivering, at that point I have to, for the sake of a thousand people that give me every minute of their time, make a change because we're not performing at the level we need to. This isn't, um, this isn't junior anymore, this is mm -hmm. in a big stage. And so that decision came about because I want success for this organization, I want success for this team, and we're not going to deliver it with what we have there. And there's something, I'm sure, again, for everyone in this room, you've dealt with this within your organizations, but an underperforming individual drags down your organization very quickly. And so you have to make the change cleanly and execute it in a good way. And it's what we did. And I was just making sure as well I had a good enough replacement in place. Mm -hmm. Franco, the whole world didn't know his name, I guarantee you, uh, until about a month ago. Now, now he's fairly known. Um, mm -hmm. but. He, he was very special, uh, just wasn't known to the world. So if I, if I take you through what I mean by that, um, drivers, his father sold his house for him to go and do one championship, which is the Formula 4 championship, which is how I spotted him. Um, they, they, uh, many fathers do this, by the way. Many families do this. They sell all their possessions, and it happens every day. Mm -hmm. He won in a team that was not at the right level, but he won. Um, and that then opened a door for him. In fact, when I, when I was personally racing in something called Asian Le Mans, he was also racing at Asian Le Mans, which is how I met him. And I realized very swiftly, he is so quick. He just drives anything that anyone can give him that he has the opportunity to. Then we put him into our simulator. He did thousands of kilometers, put him into Formula 2, and he started winning races, and then gave him an opportunity in the F1 car in Silverstone. And when we did, I was caught off guard. I didn't expect what he did in the car. And what, what wasn't visible was he was on the pace of Alex. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. This is such a step up. You're going from a, a Formula 2 car, which, which is hard to drive, to a, dry, a car, Formula 1 car that's hyperspeed. Everything just happens very quickly. And he dealt with it admirably. So the decision wasn't as hard as you may think. It just had to be executed in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say we will have a couple minutes for audience questions at the end. So start thinking if you have something. Um, but first, F1 is unique in that it's a rare sport that tears up the rule book every few years, resets everything, and we're heading for that in 2026 with a new set of specifications. Um, so it puts you in the pos this position of working on two tracks. Um, how do you manage that? How do you deal with performing this season but also preparing for this blank slate? Good, good. Yeah, it is a good question. So the agreements I have with my board, and, and the only reason why I signed to come on is I want us to be successful in 26, which means... It's not that I'm going to give up on 24, 25, or 23, but they will be very compromised, very, very compromised. So of a team of 1,000 people, think about it this way, actually even better. Our aero workforce is about um, 50. I have five people working on this year and next year. 45 people are working on 2026. A car that is, is an imagination at the moment more than anything else, but it's the right way of doing it for the long-term success of this organization. It means we don't have to think short-term anymore, we can think long-term. And the only way you can do that is you have a board and investment behind you that completely agree that we could be through a few difficult years. I mean, for transparency, we're adding large amounts of workforce. There's lots of what I call low-hanging fruit, which we're picking mm -hmm. up at the moment, which is why the team's moving forward. So it's not that we're not chasing performance in these years, but the large transformation is taking place in the future. And if I, if I step away from that, actually what we're trying to do is this. We're investing in people, culture, innovation, technology, commercial as one of the avenues as well at the same time. And, and fundamentally, all of that has a transformation being applied to it. And this year's car, and probably even more so next year's, will be a compromise. But I'm really excited by what's happening in 26, 27, and 28. And it, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing for any business in the world to do, to effectively give up almost on what you're doing. But if we don't, we're not going to be winning championships. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I joined here isn't to be sixth or fifth. It's, it's lovely. It makes me feel good inside. But I'm here to be winning. But when you do that, you still have a lot of people to convince. They're all in your shirt here that, uh, that it's going to be OK. It, it's the same thing. So um, every, every partner that's here, um, near enough, actually, there was one there, was one there that was um, in place before I joined. But pretty much all the other partners have been in place since I've joined. We'll have this conversation where I'll go through. You've got two options. I'll lay them out for you. you tell me which way you want to go. We can be 
top six, and I can carry that on for five years. Or you can be part of the biggest sports transformation that I think is going to exist in a long, long time. Because we are not tickling it. We are down to foundations, properly destroying and starting again. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be a part of that? And every single one said yes. That's what I prefer. Go that way. So they're on board. Um, if we have any questions, happy to take a couple. We have microphones. So uh, when, when a winner comes out of a racing, so either it is a car winning or it's a driver winning. I mean, it is because of the design and the kind of aerodynamics things we are using the car because of the wind or because of the skill of the driver or it's a combination of both. It, it, it depends. If I had a driver up here right now, they would go, it's the skill of a driver. Uh, but they're not here, so I can tell you what it really is. Um, the, the way I try and put it is probably the easiest way as I can put it into data. Between the best driver on the grid and the worst driver on the grid is probably one second a lap. Maybe, maybe a little bit less now, maybe eight tenths a lap. Between the best car on the grid and the worst car on the grid is probably something akin to eight tenths. So in reality, the answer is both. Um, Max is not going to win a championship in a, in a stake car, which is at the back of the grid, simple as that. Um, and nor would Lewis, for that matter. It's a more complicated answer to that, because actually what happens is the best drivers in the world, and, and I'm very privileged, because next year I really do think I have the best lineup, they push the team forward. So it's not just about the performance they have in the car, it's out of the car, how do I get absolutely everything out of this team? Every millisecond, I need it to perform for you. So actually, it drives the team performance forward as well. But if you want a, a politically correct answer, 50-50 is about the way forward. <laughs> so, uh, how do you see the idea of AI driver? Um, so it, this is a very personal one for me. I'll, I'll separate it into two things, AI and then AI driver, which is your question. AI is a fundamental part of our sport and will become a fundamental part of every single business in this room over the next 10 years. It has to be. AI driver, I'm convinced we can make a driver that is faster than our Formula One drivers today. I, I'm convinced of it. But I wouldn't watch it. It doesn't interest me at all. What I'm excited by is I have two individuals who will put their life on the line. They really do. That They can injure themselves very significantly because they're gladiators, they're elite athletes, they're pushing themselves harder than anyone else I know in this world. And that's why I'm a part of the sport. It's because I'm a part of their journey as well at the same time. So I think we can do something faster, but it doesn't excite me. We have one here. What new city would you personally want to see the Grand Prix race in? So the, um, First and foremost, actually, you asked the question the right way, which is you use the word city uh, rather than country. Because when you come to Singapore, th this really is on my top three of places to go. The whole city transforms around you, and you feel special, rewarded, a part of something that's unique and incredible. Since it joined the calendar in 2008, there's nothing else like it. You can't stand around, or, or even if you wanted to, be in an infinity pool looking over it. Formula One cars going around a street circuit at 300 kilometers an hour. That doesn't exist, and it's, it's here at night. Answering your question, though, I'm actually more one for world presence. So already, if you look at what Formula One was and what it is today, we're now at about 1.5 billion viewership around the world. Growth is enormous, especially with, in women, really under 35 women. So we've done the right thing there. But where we don't have enough presence, in my opinion, is in Asia. Um, I'm absolutely convinced of that, and other continents that we haven't even touched yet. But focusing on Asia, first and foremost, we've been in, in quite large conversations with Thailand, especially. Obviously, Alex is the first and the only driver from Thailand on the grid. Um, he speaks with a British accent. Ignore that bit. Um, but <laughs> Um, it is actually, Asia is a huge part that I just don't think we're doing a good enough job to get our presence within. I think it's actually lacking in some regards. Yes, we have Japan and we have Singapore, and great, but I think there's a huge amount more room to have more dominance within this area, more presence within this area. And um, it, it's ticking over in the background, there are, there are meetings taking place, but for me personally, I think this is the, the area I'd like to see more growth. But I'm going to follow up on that question because we are currently at 24 Grand Prix on the calendar. Yep. Um, it's about 50% more than when you would have started. Um, how much further can this stretch? I mean, there is a, a human toll, there is a logistical toll. Where, where are we going? So I, I don't think we're going to go above 24. But here's the interesting one, just as an anecdote, as teams. We used to do 16, I used to do 16 races, and I thought, well, oh, that's really tough. 
Then we went to 18 races, 19 races, 20 races, 21. It was like a, um, a frog in hot water when you boil it. It doesn't realize what's going on. Now we're at 24, and you're like, oh, this, is, this is pretty hard now. I don't think we can go above 24. I just don't think it's the right package either. You're asking, forget about us for the time being. Is it right that you're asking families at home to sit in front of a TV set for half the year, which is what it is now? Mm -hmm. that, that's not correct. I think that's, the, that's probably the upper limit of where you want to be. But we also have races that are part of our calendar that um, perhaps are not as spectacular as they once were, let's say. And there are other literal countries that want to come in and make themselves successful in the sport. And I think we should be open-minded to that. And there's ways around it. Very simply, you can rotate some of the European races. It wouldn't be a problem rotating them once every two years, creating room for mm -hmm. other avenues to come in at the same time. So I don't think we can go above 24. I don't think it's right to go above 24. But also, I think it is right to be welcoming new countries, new cities into this. Because there is a feeling right now that F1 is having a moment and you need to keep capitalizing on it. Um, you know, is there a risk of, of dilating it a little bit? Uh, definitely. I think everything's supply and demand, which is fundamentally, if you, if you provide too much of the product, people aren't going to be interested in it anymore. And, and you will kill your, both your fan base and your, your monetary source behind it as well. Uh, ju just for pretty much where we are, we're not there at the moment. I mean, the, the demand, uh, I was with F1 just last week, and there were six countries, countries that want to be a part of our calendar, and it's how you accommodate that at the moment. So, unsure how to accommodate it, apart from the rotation in the European rounds and a few other little tricks that we can do. Um, but I would say the next five years are looking very, very good. Mm -hmm. Did we have any more questions from the audience? Sure. So you sign Carlos Sainz for next year, and Franco's come into the car, scored points, potentially have a great season. Then he'll have to obviously step out for next year. Carlos comes in. How do you like continue to, I guess, like nurture that talent, and and what sort of situation does that leave you in? It's a good question. So um, Franco will always be a part of the the academy and our program, irrespective. Anyway, it, it's because that's one of the strengths I have, I invest in them. What he will be next year is if Audi don't take him, and for transparency, we are in conversations to see uh, if that is a route for him where he could be on the grid with them for two years, um, then what we would do is we run a two-year-old car, which is actually the same specification pretty much as what we're running now, and he'd be running in that for uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers to keep himself basically into a good shape. He would work with us on developing the future cars by being in our simulator and doing that testing work for us at the same time, and there were a number of racing series we're looking at him uh, with him for so that he can keep his hand really in racing at the same time. He would be our reserve driver. He'd be ready to stand by should anything happen. And what I have learned in the last 12 months is that the F1 driver situation is not over. Um, it's, it's good for us. We're signed. But w watch next year. I think you're going to see a little bit more movement. So there's more opportunity out there as well at the same time. So having one of the best drivers on the grid available, I think, will be a strength. Any other questions from the audience? I ha this lady down here. <laughs> so I'd love to ask about your talent management skills, because you've got two drivers on the team. They're both gladiators, as you say. How do you make them both better, which is what you have to do? So, so we're, I'll, cover, I'll cover a little background to that. We're a very unique sport where it's a team sport, but I have two individuals who first try and beat the other person. Because if you beat them, you look stronger than anything else. And there's not many other sports like that. Um, how I deal with that bit of it is everything is about something much bigger than the two of them or me. Everything is about Williams, fundamentally. It's about the legacy that you leave behind, the sportsmanship that you leave behind. Their impact that they have on the sport will last for decades if you do it the right way. If you do it the wrong way, it will last for minutes. Simple as that. So you, you elevate it far beyond uh, myself or the two of them. The, the next bit is um, they're like any other human beings, any part of your senior management. You just need to spend enough time with them to understand what is going on in their lives and what's important. I, I truly care about Alex and about Franco. I know um, what's going on in the family, what's going on in the history, what happened last week. And by having that knowledge and that connection with them, it's not that I'm their friend, I remain their boss. 
but I have an awareness of where they need support and where they don't need support in the grand scheme of where we're moving forward to. And I sort of apply the same rules to my senior management. And it, it is about having a connection where they, I'm asking them to do far more than be in the office from 8 till 5 p.m. They are giving their life, as far as I go, to me and every minute of it. And in return, the least I can do back to them is invest my time into them as best as possible and create a platform where I'm always there and available. And if there's anything I can do, I will do as a result of it. So that's a little bit of it. And the second part of it is I have certain rules that I've always worked by as a sportsman. And I ask them to abide by the same rules, which is no one wants to win because you've cheated your way there. I want to do things because you are proud of what you've achieved and everyone else will be proud of what you've achieved. And that, that for a sportsman is the highest accolade they can achieve. So you create a construct where they will move towards it. So how often are you in one-on-one -on -one conversation with the drivers? How often will you check in? Uh, every weekend, fundamentally, and now outside of that, um, messaging pretty much every two days or so, Some, something in that ballpark, enough that you're connected to them, mm -hmm. uh, enough that they get irritated by me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've talked about how the job of team principal has changed. We've talked about how the technology has changed. Um, but how has... How, what other ways have you seen the kind of profile of F1 change and how do you experience that sort of with the resurgence we've seen in the past few years? I mean, it, it was your own question that you spoke about it. What, what's really changed is Netflix Drive to Survive. Uh, I've been doing this for, for nearly 30 years and um, the viewership went up, as you would imagine, and the interest went up, as you would imagine as well. It's around COVID time, but around that 2018, 19 region, it exploded. It wasn't a sport anymore about two drivers. It was a sport about us as a team and what we're doing and how we're doing it as a result of things. Uh, and here was the interesting thing. Netflix, when it was presented to us, wasn't number one on the things that would change the sport. It was number 16. We had no idea what it was going to do to the sport. And what's changed now is my life is not just about building the fastest engineering car that we can. It, it is to what you said. We have to deal with... Uh, the social aspects of things. And more importantly, that is uh, as important now a part as anything else. Um, so that's what's changed, really. The second bit is, when I started in this sport, it was a sport. It really was a sport. It was about go to the track, do the best you can. The, the logos on the car, don't worry about those. Just, just go do the best you can. It's a business now. We have to make sure that we have partners who want to be by our side, who believe in what we're doing. And we are open and honest with them as well on that journey. And that's it's a much better way of operating a business. Mm -hmm. a, a little anecdote story, it's just because it's funny. In my last place, we had the, the UK tax organization come and see us. Uh, we'd been operating for 18 years. And they came to see us because they said, you haven't made profit in 18 years. And went, yep, welcome to Formula One. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't believe it. They said, basically, that was Formula One businesses. And if you think about it, that you can't run an organization that way. That's why... At the end of 2008, so many teams pulled out. That's why even when it got to COVID, we thought Formula One was over. It wasn't. That was the resurgence. We've made it into a business now, and that's mm -hmm. what's changed, and it's good. And does that shifting profile and kind of the greater attention on teams that don't win every week, does that help you too? Um, I, I think it's only a good thing, because as long as you're true to who you are and you're playing an act on things, no one can strip that away from me fundamentally. Are you saying there are people in Formula One who are acting? I may, I may have <laughs> intonated as such. I mean, there is a lot of anger in the room. When they film it, genuinely, there is anger there. But um, there are some that play up to it. For me, by all means, attack what we're doing. But I'm confident in the pathway that we are taking, confident in the investment we're doing. And I will be very open and clear on what our pathway was and where we're going towards. And that... That has negatives and positives associated with it. But what I found so far is no one can take that apart in the media. Whereas if you're caught in a lie, mm -hmm. you can be stripped of everything. That's the best way I can put it to you. <laughs> um, any final questions? Thank you. Very insightful. Uh, do you think as the world is normalizing EV, is uh, Formula One going to move to electrification? So, so this, is a, this is a fascinating question because... Uh, EV is being normalized, but if you follow EV car prices, just do it in residual prices, you will see that they are rock bottom because there's no interest in it fundamentally. The UK wasn't ready with the infrastructure, and, and I'm not sure it's the overall solution for the fact that it's still going to have 1.4 billion cars on the road in a few years' time. So answering the question, this is now very much my opinion. I'm not attached to a manufacturer, but what we're doing for 2026 in F1 is we're going to a fully synthetic fuel. A fully synthetic fuel, which, by the way, has more power than the fuel we're running today. It's extraordinary. 
It pulls carbon out of the air to create it. It's made from effectively biomass. And it's a clean burn as well. So it's actually better than carbon neutral. Um, it costs a lot at the moment, but it won't in the future. This is my opinion, but if you want a way of surviving through not just EV, but a way of the world having cars on the road, synthetic fuel will get you a long way there for many years until we figure out what the right technology is. Irrespective of all that, though, our cars are the most efficient engines that exist, in the, apart from gas turbines, I mean a, a fuel-powered one. There's nothing even close to it in terms of efficiency at the moment because we use electrification um, in that purpose, but it's more as a hybrid route rather than the pure EV. And I, I believe, again, about just being optimized for what you're doing. Every gram of fuel that goes into the car, first of all, should be optimized to the nth degree, which is what these Formula One engines do. But beyond there, I think we should be finding solutions that help the entire world, not just a racing series. That's why one of the reasons why I joined our sport. This is like engineering, but you're doing it 50 times faster than anyone else, and you're proving it out in front of 50, 50 to 70 million people. So it's sort of answering your question. I, I'm not sure EV is the right solution worldwide across every single continent for the next 10 years, but I think synthetic fuel can fill a void. And following on from that, uh, the way it always was when the manufacturers were directly fielding teams um, was, that the F was that F1 was the very high-end R&D department. Um, is that still the case, or have F1 and sort of the road car business diverged? No, it, it's still very much the, the R&D for it. I mean, all, all of the cars that you would have come here today would have had technology developed in Formula One. That doesn't matter if it's traction control or ABS or some of the wide height controls you're doing, active suspension, all of that developed. Actually, a lot of that developed in Williams, for what it's worth. Um, those are all products developed in it. Um, in high-end cars, carbon chassis, the carbon work that goes around things, or even some of the different technologies and methods used in manufacturing developed in Formula One. What isn't is production methods, because we produce three items. We don't produce 10,000 of them. Mm -hmm. So production methods are developed outside of it. But as I said before, one of the reasons why I joined this sport is I want to make a real world difference with what I'm doing. I, I love going around in circles very quickly, don't get me wrong, but I also enjoy the fact that what I have done has made a real world difference. And um, as I said, you'll see synthetic fuel is one of those, and some of the other technologies we're coming up with are that as well. But they haven't diverged as much as you may think at the moment. Mm -hmm. Any more in the room? I have more. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, sorry, I just looked up your profile and I, I see that you've worked at Braun GP. So maybe could you tell us a bit about your experience back there? Because it was a team that wasn't supposed to exist, but ended up winning the World Championship. So maybe share a bit about your experience there. Uh, I mean, how long have you got? Because I can talk <laughs> about this for, for days. Um, so, so for all of those that don't know, Braun GP was a fairy tale story. I don't think it will ever exist again in our sport. We were um, a team without a manufacturer behind us. With, with no money, and I really do mean no money at all. And we won the Formula One World Championship against the greats at the time. And it, it really was, what you read is what was happening. So a little bit of background to it. We were Honda in 2008. It came into the financial crisis, and uh, Honda, not just Honda, Honda Toyota, a number of other manufacturers pulled all of their funding. So overnight, um, about 910 people lost their job. Uh, I was one of those people. The following day, 910 people were in the factory. The following week, 910 people were in the factory. We had no job. We kept working on a car that we believed in so much that we wanted it to get going. And I was part, I was very fortunate to be part of a senior management team who were desperately trying to effectively find either a buyer or a way of us moving forward. Um, and several things happened. Uh, first and foremost, we got a, a little bit of funding from Honda. To, instead of closing the doors, effectively they gave us a pool of money and said, here you go, um, we have no responsibility anymore. Um, Mercedes, we managed to convince them to put an engine in the back of it. Um, the, the chassis is a big carbon lump. It's basically a big hinge that connects the engine to, to the wheels. We actually had to cut off the back um, 50 millimeters of it to fit the engine in. Uh, we couldn't fit any of the hybrid unit in at all. All we could fit in was the engine that year. But, and there was a but to it, why were we all doing this? That car had been developed by all of us for 12 months in three different wind tunnels. I could tell you, hands down, that was going to be the quickest car out there because that's what we invested in. We put all of our effort in. You can sort of see why in Williams I'm doing something similar. You just basically forward, forward link to a future performance state. Um, Probably the saddest moment of that year was that as I got on an airplane to go to Melbourne, um, we, we made 400 
450 people redundant. So if you if you had an airplane ticket, you knew you were safe. That was pretty much how it worked um, at that point, which is sad. But we couldn't survive with a large organization. We had to effectively shrink right down to what the bare bones were. We, we didn't have enough money to go testing. Um, so we actually went testing at Silverstone. There's a tiny little track. It's not the big track. It's a tiny little track. And we did 50 laps around it, and the car seemed to work put it inside a truck, transported it to Barcelona, where everyone had been testing already for three weeks. Um, took it out the truck, same tires, rolled it out, um, went out and did basically just a six time that run so that Jensen Button, who's a part of Williams today as well, got used to it. Um, he came back in and he said, I'm, I'm so sorry, the car is the car's terrible. It's re I really, it's not handling very well at all. We're like, okay, tell us what's wrong, right, we'll fix this. Just too much understeer in the car, fixed it. He went back out, same tires we ran for Silverstone, so they're now 60 laps old. Came back in and said, I'm so sorry, I thought this was our year, but, but the car doesn't feel good. We walked into the timing page where we were three and a half seconds faster than anyone else, and he went, well, actually, the car's fine, as it turns out. <laughs> um, so we, that day, we loaded it with fuel and ballast and just made it as heavy as we possibly could. They kept deleting our lap times uh, because they thought we were cutting the chicane. Um, it, was, it was just the strangest thing. All the teams would come up to us and go, I, I know you're having to run it illegal to get sponsors. I'm like, yeah, okay. Anyway, it turned up at the first race, and um, we, we were missing so many people that even the, the back then you had to do refueling. The people that did the refueling, they, they actually wanted to leave, so we let them go. So we had no team that had ever done a live refueling before. And if you look back at Melbourne, you'll see each pit stop took about 20 seconds longer than it should have done. And yet we finished one too. By the way, the refueler, we, he, he became a, an electrician. We actually paid him just to fly out at weekends to do refueling. And then we flew him back home and he, he did uh, electrician back home. But it, it was an incredible year where um, everything just went right. We only had two chassis, two front wings, two rear wings for the first six races, which we won all of them. If anyone had hit us once or we made a mistake, our championship would have been over. It was a, a fascinating year and a lovely year. And, um, but we haven't got all night, but it's a <laughs> good thing to know out of it. Well, we wish you much of the same at Williams. Um, thank you, James. Thank you very much.